Hello, I'm Jerry Hancock from Men in Balance, and today we have a really special guest, Sis Kaplan, who is no stranger to anybody who's been in radio in Charlotte. Sis and Stan, of course, bought big waves back in the 60s and uh, made it into a powerhouse station. Welcome, Sis. Glad you're here. Thank you. So, um, I, I guess my first question I'd like to talk to you about today is was there life before ways <laughs> big ways and what was it I know you um, you went to Rollins College is that correct that is correct actually um, I life um, was good before and during and after big ways <laughs> um, the before big ways I, I actually worked in I did go to Rollins graduated from Rollins and went to work in Chicago, where I, which was home to me, and um, worked for CBS radio and television um, for, let's see, about eight years, and then worked in baseball. I worked for Bill Beck, ah. who owned the Chicago White Sox. Um, and Aaron Cushman, who had an agency, and it was through the agency. Um, and I produced, I spent three months studying baseball and then ended up um, producing um, shows, talk shows with Bill and how to baseball sh shows with Pony Leagues and the White Sox and the Cubs and did that for several years. And before I met Stan and we ended up, he was in Boston and I moved to Boston when we got married and worked for an ad agency there and lived there for about a year before we bought ways yeah so um how did that come about i mean did you all, you didn't just one night say gosh there's a radio station down south i think we'll go buy it no the truth is we almost moved to new york because i didn't i wasn't happy doing what i was doing at the agency in boston and i had gotten a job at abc wide world of sports as a producer and we were looking for apartments in New York, and um, a friend of ours, they knew we were interested in radio stations somewhere that we could afford that was a growing market. And they introduced us to this opportunity, which was Ways in Charlotte. And I had never heard of Charlotte, North Carolina. The only thing I'd ever heard of was Chapel Hill. Um, and I was the one who ended up coming down here to do the due diligence and um, ended up buying the station and moving to Charlotte, mm. which was quite a culture shock. Yeah, that, that would have been like 1965, right? That's correct. Yeah. And it, and so were very different here then. Yeah, well, Waze was already on the air, but a very sleepy kind of station, as I recall. Is that right? Correct. It was yeah. like last place or something. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah, it was pretty much a uh, um, on tape kind of station. Right. Yeah, I remember listening to it back then. Um, so Stan is not the kind of guy that's going to stand by and, let, and have the status quo. So he, he turned the place upside down, right? Well, I think we did. Um, it was, uh, he was really good at promotional ideas. Um, and I guess I was good at programming and running the joint. And um, we had some really talented people. And Jack Gale, who was who unfortunately is no longer with us either, um, was the program director and morning man. And we, I used to travel around listening to radio stations to try to figure out who we wanted between the time and before we took over the station. 
to figure out who we wanted to hire from where and um, tried to put together a good staff and continued to try to do that. Yeah, I remember the very first time I heard Jack Gale on the radio and I said, wow, this is a new kind of radio for this market. It, it was just so totally different from anything out there. Yeah, he was very, very talented guy. And so then you went on to hire some other big names, Jay right. Thomas and Murphy in the morning. Let's talk about those. Right, Murphy um, and Jay Thomas. Jay is no longer with us either. Um, unfortunately, he died of cancer. Um, and Murphy is still going strong. And um, I'm... I stay a little bit in touch with him. Um, you know, we occasionally, when I get to Chicago, that was before the COVID world, um, we would stay in contact and we are on Facebook, we're friends, so. Yeah, I gotta tell you a funny story about um, Murphy in the morning. I was working at the Chamber of Commerce, and we did a program called Leadership School, which in which we introduced young executives to different parts of the community. And we had a session on- I had a, uh, one of those classes. Yeah, and uh, we, uh, we had one on the media, and Stan was on the panel for that class that day. So somebody asked him, how much are you paying Murphy in the morning? And he said, whatever he wants. <laughs> <laughs> so that, 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 that was a very popular um, move. Yeah, well, Murphy, Murphy did well financially, but he also, um, because of his enormous talent, and <clears throat> we were talking about Larry Sprinkle before we went on, um, he and Larry were an absolute fantastic pair. And um, the two of them together were, were fantastic. And Murphy was an enormous talent, yeah. or still is yeah. an enormous talent. I was surprised to learn there's still a um, website called Murphy in the Morning Radio. I didn't know that, but uh, and some of the stuff, stuff from Big Ways is on there. Right, yeah. right. So um, yeah, you're right, uh, uh, Larry Sprinkle brought a wealth of voices. I mean, I, I, this guy had more voices in him than anybody I've ever heard of. Well, he used to do terrible things. I mean, he, the radio station was uh, out in Oakdale, which is north and west. And he, when a new disc jockey would come on, who would be an all night, let's say, guy, he would call up and send them out to do something on the towers. <laughs> or he, but he kid everybody. I mean, he, he would call me in a voice and it was the FCC <laughs> calling. And of course, in those days, the FCC was a very much a regulatory agency, unlike today where they're not. Yeah. And he'd make appointments. He'd call Stan to come up to make a sales call. I mean, it was just, he had everybody. And it, <clears throat> one of the worst things he did is there was a new young woman in bookkeeping. And of course the station was on a cement uh, slab. There was no basement. And we built, we had built a really lovely new radio station there and that was state of the art at the time and um, architecturally a wonderful building. And this woman was sitting out in an area um, and he claimed to be in the basement and he told her that she better move or she better, you know, not, he could see from below where she was sitting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and this woman left for lunch and never came back. <laughs> the first day. <laughs> I mean, it, 
there was no end to his uh, pranks. Well, speaking of which, you, uh, the legend has it that you did some of your own pranks. I mean, like walking through the studio with a horse when somebody's doing the news. Is that real? Uh, it was a pony. A pony. Well, so big difference. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the purpose of that? Just just a prank. Yeah. Well, it, um, it sounded like a fun place to work. Everybody I talked to who was out there. And you had some great names. You raised some great names, even in the news business. Uh, yeah. Names like Bruce Bowers, Mike Koza, and uh, others that came through there. Right. Yeah. It... Um... It was a, yeah, John Kilgo um, put together a really good news operation. And I'll tell you how we ended up in the news business. When I came down to Charlotte and it was election time. And for the first time since reconstruction, there was a black running for city council. Um, I'm blanking on his name now. He was a dentist. Reginald Hawkins, was that him? Right. And the WBT, who was the powerhouse station at the time, um, cut away to religion in the middle of the coverage of the election night. And I said to Stan, I said, we're going to put a news operation in there along with rock and roll because there is, I mean, I, I couldn't believe that what my ears were, were hearing that night. And um, that's, that's how we decided to have a strong news operation. Yeah, but you had a great news operation. I mean, it was very credible and um, always on the spot. In fact, <laughs> here's a funny anecdote. I was um, at UNCC in the late 60s and uh, I had a poetry reading outdoors and one of the poets decided to read anti-war poetry. And so he got up on a rock and was reading anti-war poetry. That, that would have been the first for UNCC. And all of a sudden, Big Ways is out there covering the story. And I said, how the hell did they know about that? <laughs> and so uh, the headlines were that uh, Charlotte, the UNC had its first anti-war protest. <laughs> but Big Ways was right there. And so um, let's talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day operation in the station. I mean, I know husband and wife teams are... Um, uh, Difficult. They're difficult. And my wife and I did that for 30 years, so I can say that. <clears throat> um, so anyway, how did that work out for the two of you as a husband and wife team? Well, I would say obviously more good than bad, although there was an occasional uh, difference and confrontation, et cetera. Um, we basically agreed in the very beginning that um, no major decisions um, could be made unless we both agreed on it. And if we didn't, then if one was strongly opposed to a major decision, we would not, you know, proceed with whatever that decision was. Yeah. So that helped. Um, and it, you know, we were both um, busy and I was also probably much more community involved than he was. Um, so although we were there together and operated together, it isn't as if we were you know, on top of each other all day. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to remember the name, Joan and Bob, who ran the Charlotte Merchandise Mart. Who am I thinking about? Zimmerman. Zimmerman, right. So they had a funny story about that. I, I asked Bob one time, I said, how did it work out for you working with your wife all the time? He said, well, we made a decision a long time ago 
that uh, she would make all the small decisions and I would make all the big decisions. And so far, there hasn't been any big decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that sometimes works out. Well, Stan was such a promoter. I mean, he he would do anything for uh, attention and it worked, right? Well, the nobody had done I mean, this was a really, 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 really sleepy market. I mean, when uh, people who were here today, who weren't here a hundred years ago, like the two of us were, um, I don't think can realize what the difference was between Charlotte then and Charlotte now. And um, it's, it's amazing how little, if any, promotion existed here. Basically, BT at that time owned the market. And in terms, when I say owned the market, they were doing by far the most business. And they had the ratings. Um, and nobody promoted anything. So to, to have to come in and do some crazy things, which we did. I mean, we started out with the treasure hunts. Right. <laughs> where we had 10 $1,000 treasure hunts. And that uh, was difficult. And the FCC uh, stopped all treasure hunts after that. Um, and my understanding was you left a bunch of craters all over Charlotte. <laughs> and. You know, and quite that bad. <laughs> That's an exaggeration. Is that an exaggeration? One of the funniest, and I won't say where it was, but one of the treasures that was buried not in Mecklenburg County um, because the station covered a uh, considerable area. And the sheriff insisted that we tell him where the treasure was. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it's a little smaller than Mecklenburg at that time county. And I said, well, I really can't do that. Um, so that uh, was one of the funny parts of the treasure hunts. But we didn't tear up places. And if the people did tear them up, we fixed it back. <clears throat> well, uh, it, it created quite a um, stir, yeah. of course, in Charlotte, because it was, like you said, it was, nothing like that had been done before. And I guess eventually you were able to knock BT off the top of the market. Uh, and right. That happened under Larry uh, 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 Murphy in the morning? No, it happened before that. I mean, it happened back in the Jack Gill. Oh, yeah, um, I mean, it was fairly quick. And um, also we, you know, bought billboards, which were big then, uh, much more so than they are today and more important in terms of a media uh, purchase. And um, we just did a lot of, we did some television and it, we did a lot of promoting, so. so you mentioned earlier um, the sort of the division of labor between you and Stan. I mean, you were uh, doing more of the hands-on stuff and he was doing more of the creative thinking, I guess, promotional stuff. Um, so did, did you overlap a lot in that? I mean, did you bounce ideas off each other pretty much? Um, no, we, we did overlap because, I mean, it was, um, he, he basically, it, he handled more local sales. I handled national sales. Um, and I was more in programming. But we both, as I say, there were no major decisions of any sort that, that we both weren't involved in. Yeah. So most uh, small businesses, when they start up, um, at least have some lean years. Did you guys ever have any lean years or are you? Oh, indeed, really? indeed, indeed. And there were, you know, recession times and uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, everything wasn't a piece of cake. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was, you know, Charlotte was interesting back then. So talk about 
how Charlotte has changed over the years as far as you've seen it. I know you said it was a sleepy town, and it was in 1965. It was, it was sort of a banker town, and that was it, right? Well, it wasn't even that to the extent that it is today. I mean, at least, um, you know, it was a more rural in some ways. Um, and it certainly didn't have many of the amenities that exist today. It didn't have, I mean, one, it had no restaurants that were worth, you know, what, mm -hmm. uh, and not until liquor by the drink occurred, which was in the seventies, I think like 78, right. yeah. wasn't it somewhere around About there? 76, I think. Was it, um, that that the hospitality industry blossomed and um, it was it was just a very a time that unless you lived in the south I don't think anybody knew what she, Charlotte Charlottesville Charleston what you know it nobody knew what the name was yeah. uh, when you said I mean nobody in Chicago knew where Charlotte was. Oh. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, my mother, which who wasn't very far from the truth, said that they would probably be burning crosses on our front yard. Mm. And that wasn't far from truth. Oh. Uh, but, um, I mean, the Klan was active. But now we have the, what do you call it, boys? The Proud Boys. So we've got the power. We have another version of it now. Yeah, well, really. Um, so back to the station just for a minute. Um, so you, you built basically a state-of-the-art station, which uh, had to be. Your audio, your audio is bad for a second I'm, there, Jerry. I'm, I was just saying you bought you created a state-of-the-art station, which was not inexpensive at that time, right? You're breaking up. Oh, I can I? hear you, but I mean, it's very staticky. Hmm. I don't know why. It must be an internet connection. Um, so anyway, you, um, you built a state-of-the-art station with top-of-the-line equipment and a newsroom and all that. that. That had to be a big capital outlay to get started. Well, it was, we didn't do that day one. Um, we basically, day one what we did because there was a little building there and we had a trailer, we brought a trailer out and rented a, a trailer and turned it into, that was the sales office. Um, and we operated, I can't remember the year we actually built um, the new building, but it was, in the seven, you know, well into the seventies. So it, um, I mean, the only thing we did in the start is we equipped the studio and um, a new studio to the, so it, you know, we had a good uh, quality situation. And we also, the signal of the radio station was improved dramatically when we redid the copper wiring connecting the stations because yeah. all all the stations in Charlotte are you know directional yeah including uh, BT at night yeah so um, how about WROQ how did that come about when did that come about what what made you go into FM well because AM was you know FM was pretty much non-existent in the 60s when we bought ways and between we also uh, bought a station in Florida WAPE in Jacksonville in 1970 and um, then and that was an a or is an AM station uh, and then FM started to become a major major factor and we realized we had to have an FM station. And um, that's how we then bought WROQ. And, so I don't remember, uh, is that, did you buy an existing station? 
Yes, yes. Changed the call letters, but bought an existing station, yeah. So did you have the studios in Radio Road also? Oh, yeah. Okay. Just both, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that part Studio. I wasn't clear about. I remember you had some uh, great jocks on there, too, who got, got quite a following and good ratings. Right, right. And Calvin, was, I remember Calvin. Right, right. It was an alternative rock, and then... Um, you know, it was programmed differently, and some of it was simulcast yeah. um, in the mornings. So um, we'll switch gears a bit and talk a little bit about the other parts of your life. I know you were very active in the um, in your faith community back in the '60s, and in, I'm, I'm remembering that Charlotte was not necessarily welcoming to people of the Jewish faith. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you experienced there um, and what um, what things were like then. Well, yeah, I think that's true. Um, but probably, I hate to say this, but um, I would say that there is more anti-Semitism today uh, at least, I guess the last four years have made it socially acceptable, whether it's anti-Semitism or anti-Muslim or anti-Black um, today than ever before. Um, now, I don't mean the African-American situation in Charlotte was far worse. I mean, it was just, it was just starting to get away from the back of the bus. And, um, but it was, the Klan was very active. I mean, we, for instance, um, I have a daughter who is, um, a we, you know, we had a daughter, uh, Stan and I, that, uh, went to public school, Irwin Avenue, when it, uh, after this was at the time of integration, and we were called by the Klan and threatened, and they also threatened to kidnap her. Oh, my gosh. And our phone lines, of course, they then, the FBI was involved, and they tapped our phone lines, so and they ended up catching um, these guys and tried them. Um, and we testified in court. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Um, and it was, a, it was an interesting time. And it's funny because we never told my daughter this. And maybe it was before Stan died, but you know, she was well an adult at the time. Somehow at dinner, we got talking about it one night with some people who were at dinner. And she never knew about it because we never told her she was in kindergarten and, um, or first grade, I can't remember which it was, but um, she said, I just thought those teachers were nice to me when they stayed around me outside during recess. Uh -huh. I just thought they liked me. <laughs> Wow. Uh, but it was not the Jews in Charlotte um, at that time were very um, much within themselves and yeah. not terribly in, you know, although some were involved, but they basically weren't in a, we were in an in a business that made it, and because of the promotion and the action and activity of the station, um, we, I guess, became a little more prominent in the uh, visible, let's put it that way. Yeah, and it didn't help any that you were from the North either. <laughs> did it? Right, right, a Yankee plus a Jew didn't, uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't do much good at that point. Yeah. And I don't which was maybe one, depend on who you talk to, which was worse, a Yankee or a Jew. Wow. Um, 
we had Barbara Tita come speak to our Sunday school class a year or so ago about anti-Semitism and how prevalent it still is. Can you hear me? I, I'm having real difficulty understanding you, Jerry. I don't know what's happened, but you, the your audio has just gotten totally garbled. How about now? Is this any better? No. Hmm. I don't know what could be the issue there. Um, but can you, did you hear the question or not? I, I didn't hear the name. You yeah. said you had someone speak to you. Yeah, Barbara Tita, the rabbi from UNC Charlotte, uh, teaches at UNC Charlotte. She did a, a session for our Sunday school class about anti-Semitism in the current time. And, and I had, things I hadn't even known about are still, there's still a lot of anti-Semitism around. Oh, absolutely. And, and more so now, I think the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, it was a year or two ago, I don't know if it was in 2000 or it was in 19, that um, there were more anti-Semitic um, violent acts than all the rest put together. And this is countrywide, not Charlotte specific. So um, in your own life, Stan died, of course, in 2001. And so what have you done with yourself since then? I know you're very active. Um, what have I done with myself? I suppose not as much as I should. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, <clears throat> yeah, I am. I'm involved in, um, I do volunteer. Well, I was still working at that point, but um, when he died, uh, but then uh, I guess maybe three years later, um, I retired and uh, continued to do volunteer work, which I've done all my life. Um, I mean, even when I was, you know, at the height of the activity at the radio world, I was still involved in on all kinds of boards within the community and I'm currently still involved I involved with my condo association um, I volunteer for the council for children's rights um, and I'm on the board of uh, Dilworth community association so I'm staying active and into what's going on. Yeah. Well, I gotta say, it was great to catch up with you again. I have missed seeing you over the years, and uh, it's right. good to have you on here, and good to hear the stories about big waves and the radio years. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, it was fun years, and yeah. um, the industry is very different today. Yeah. Um, and thank you. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks, sis. Appreciate you being with us. Sis Kaplan, former owner of uh, W-A-Y-S, W-R-O-Q, and a big force in radio in Charlotte in the 60s, 70s, and beyond. So thanks again for being with us.